Welcome back to Morning Joe. Our next guest says the practice of democracy requires a few lessons from Abraham Lincoln. The 16th president of the United States made it a practice to meet with a wide range of people, including those with different beliefs he felt were wrong. His goal to find something in those conversations that was in the public interest, whether it was a political alliance or a public policy. Those lessons from Lincoln's past could help us work through our current polarized political climate. Joining us now, the host of Morning Edition and up first on NPR, Steve Inskeep, his new book. It's titled Differ We Must, How Lincoln Succeeded in a Divided America. It is on sale today. Steve, congratulations. It's great to see you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Happy Pub Day. And we know your mom is watching. Yes, so we're going to be at our best. Yes. Hi, Mom. We're going to be at our very best. Good. Um, so is it too much to ask to reach back to Abe Lincoln to help guide us through these times? I don't think it is too much to ask for this reason. We think of Lincoln as almost a secular saint. Uh, someone who was almost above human measure, but he was in fact a human being and he was a politician in a very divided time who realized that if it was going to remain a republic, it was going to remain a democracy and one country, he didn't have to persuade everybody to agree with him, but he needed to build a majority. And by do, in order to do that, he needed to deal with people who differed with him on a lot of different issues and find some common ground. And even when he couldn't do that, he would try somehow to use or take advantage of his exchanges with people. You know, p people who say now, we've never been more divided. You have to stop saying, let's yeah. not forget the Civil War, for God's sakes. Yeah. So did Abraham Lincoln in those times, did he have people on the other side of the aisle who he could reach out to yeah. because in many ways Joe Biden pitched himself as a you know sort of above the fray bipartisan president has worked in the Senate has a lot of friends on the other side but he's found that to be a difficult Yeah, task. and of course there were limits. I mean, Lincoln ended up in a war with people on the other right. side with whom he could not compromise, and yet he talked with all kinds of people. There were radical anti-slavery figures like Frederick Douglass, who's a major character here, who felt that Lincoln was not going far enough, fast enough, and even accused him of, quote, Negro hatred on the way to the Emancipation Proclamation. He was a critic on one side. There were critics on the other side, including slave owners that Lincoln tried to deal with. The title, Differ We Must, is a quote from a letter that Lincoln wrote to his best friend, Joshua Speed, who came from a slaveholding family, admitted in the abstract that slavery was wrong, but in Lincoln's opinion was not serious politically about ending it. And Lincoln said, you're wrong about this. Here's why you're wrong. But if for this we must differ, differ we must. And rather than ostracizing this guy, he signed the letter, your friend forever. And in the end, when the war came, he got some use out of this man, Joshua Speed, for the union. Steve, uh, I loved the book that David Blight did on Frederick Douglass, oh, which kind of broke down how Douglass was very critical of Lincoln, even though they would talk and uh, later became much more appreciative of Lincoln, which I didn't know because a lot of people feel Lincoln and Douglas were like hand in glove and that wasn't true. Talk to us about how, and I'm hoping it's in the book, that it took a certain kind of self-confidence and, 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 and stability uh, of Lincoln to be able to deal with people that was basically on his side but was critical and to deal with those that were opposed. He must have been a man that did not deal with a lot of his own insecurities like we've seen some presidents of late. Just not to mention anyone in particular, but I think maybe I know where you're going with that. I think it's great uh, that you use the phrase self-confidence, the word self-confidence, because Lincoln had a lot of it. He was a humble guy. He wasn't an arrogant guy. He was very humble in his presentation. But I think that came from a place of confidence. He knew who he was. He was very smart. He had confidence in his ability to reason through the situation. And if someone like Frederick Douglass was extremely critical of him, he could take that on board. And when finally Douglas came to the White House in 1863, which is one of the major meetings of the 16 meetings in this book, to protest about Lincoln's treatment of black soldiers in the Civil War, Lincoln didn't say send him away. The big crowded ante room, tons of visitors in the White House, he said send the man in right away, and they had a conversation. And Lincoln admitted to Frederick Douglass, I have been slow. I will allow that you could see that I have been slow to do some things that need to be done, but I am as moving as fast as I can politically. And once I have taken a position, I will not retreat, which Douglass took as the most important statement that Lincoln was not going to give up on his commitment to end slavery. Steve, I have a strong suspicion that given the American education system, a lot of Americans 
come to think of Lincoln as an ordinary guy who became extraordinary only through the course of the Civil War and what happened, keeping the country together during the course of the Civil War. But it appears, I think, as well as your book, other books, point out that Lincoln seemed to have extraordinary political instincts uh, and how to operate within those instincts to keep everything, his cabinet together and the country together. I, I agree with you on every point. My mom, who's watching, told me that she grew up with an idea of Lincoln, as you described, that he became president almost by chance. And there was an element of chance in the Republican convention in 1860, but he worked really hard at the politics, exactly as you say. He thought about people, he empathized with other people, and he tried to figure out how to motivate them. He had an idea of humanity, which sounds a little grim, that people are primarily motivated by self-interest. Oh. But having concluded that, he tried to harness their self-interest to a higher cause. He would talk to white voters. It's an almost entirely white electorate, entirely white in his state of Illinois. He would talk to white voters about why slavery was bad for them. He would say, slavery makes a mockery of our pretensions as a beacon of liberty in the world. The rest of the world laughs at us about this. He would say, you think slavery is in the South and we're in this northern state and it's far away. Slavery can spread and it will spread here and damage you and hurt your job. He was talking to people about how this issue would affect them, which can sound a little cynical, but it's what he felt was necessary to build a coalition, to build support for something that people may not have felt all that connected to. This story is so amazing because you're writing about an argument over human bondage, and there's yeah. not really any black or no. white there, but yet Lincoln was able to fight with his opponents and yet not look at them with contempt. And how did he manage <clears throat> to do that? And also, what role did his relationship with his wife and the grief that oh, they were going through play into his human interactions? Yeah, um, he has a remarkable statement at one point talking to a free state audience in Illinois. So it's an audience of white voters. And he says, the first thing to think about is that slave owners are not worse human beings than we are. If we were in their place, we might do the same thing, which is a dark thought. But his idea was slave owners acted out of self-interest to preserve something that benefited them. So he took this humble position, essentially, that we are all flawed. We are all human beings. We all have problems. We all act out of self-interest. But having admitted that, how can we move in a more moral direction? How can we match our self-interest with a moral cause? So having said, don't act like you're superior to the other guy. Don't demonize even these people doing this terrible thing. Let's talk about the terrible system, and let's change the terrible system. And you're right, Steve, with regards to Mary Todd, an extraordinary carriage ride. Yes. On April 14th, 1865, the day he was assassinated. Yeah. What did they talk about on that ride? I'm, I'm glad you brought it up, Lise, because um, it's a fascinating uh, marriage, and also it was a very difficult marriage. Lincoln probably was not the ideal husband because he's out traveling, he's being a politician, he's being a lawyer, he's lost in thought, he suffers from depression. Uh, she is also thought to have had some form of mental illness and was temperamental and, and had difficulty controlling her impulses and, and everything else. It was a terrible struggle, this marriage. Um, but she was politically astute, politically smart, and ambitious as he was, and supported his ambition. And at the very end of the war, on the last day of Lincoln's life, they take a carriage ride, and Lincoln says, we must try to be more cheerful from now on. Mm. And you can see him in that moment thinking about the possibility of happier times because the war is ending, the presidency is succeeding. Maybe they can be happier together with one another. That was a thought that he had hours before going mm -hmm. to Ford's Theater. Yeah, brighter future for the marriage and the country yeah. at large. The new book is titled Differ We Must, How Lincoln Succeeded in a Divided America, a perfect book for this mm -hmm. moment in time. Steve Inskeep, really it's great to have you here. Thanks for bringing us the story. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.